This is Space Time, Series 20, Episode 49. Coming up on Space Time. Earth in the supernova kill zone. Hundreds of new planets discovered. And the possible detection of quark-gluon plasma in proton-proton collisions. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study claims the cool zone around a supernova could be as great as 50 light years. In other words, any star that blew up within 50 light years of the Earth could cause a mass extinction event on this planet. The studies also found some tantalising hints that even far more distant supernovae may have already changed human evolution forever. Last year on Space Time, we reported how astronomers discovered slam-dunk evidence based on iron-60 isotope readings from ancient seabed samples that showed supernovae have regularly buffeted the Earth, and one of them occurred just 2.6 million years ago. Supernovae are powerful cataclysmic explosions marking the death of a star. These blasts release enough energy to briefly outshine an entire galaxy. Original estimates place the one that exploded 2.6 million years ago at a distance of about 300 light years. New calculations reported in the Astrophysical Journal by Professor Adrian Malott from the University of Kansas have now revised those distance estimates to around 150 light years. Malott says a supernova exploding at that distance is highly unlikely to trigger mass extinction events on Earth. Previous estimates have placed the kill zone for a supernova at around 25 light years from the Earth. However, new research by Malott and colleagues has now placed the kill zone for a supernova closer to around 40 or 50 light years from the Earth. Malott says, consequently, an event 150 light years away is still a comfortable distance with little likelihood of setting off a mass extinction event on Earth. Of course, in addition to its distance, interstellar conditions at the time of the supernova would also influence its lethality to biology on Earth. One of the things supernovae produce are high-energy cosmic rays, subatomic particles travelling at close to the speed of light. Because they're ionised, cosmic rays love travelling along magnetic field lines. And consequently, they don't like cutting across magnetic field lines because they experience inhibiting forces. So, magnetic field lines can either create a superhighway for cosmic rays, or they can create a roadblock. Previous estimates have assumed that much of the local magnetic field in our galaxy has been blasted away by a series of supernova events, creating what scientists call the local bubble, a region of lower than normal density interstellar medium through which the Sun and the solar system are currently travelling. It's thought the supernova, which occurred 2.6 million years ago, was also inside this local bubble. Consequently, any cosmic rays from that supernova would not only have reached the Earth, but they would also have penetrated down into the Earth's lower atmosphere. Malott says, at the very least, cosmic rays from the supernova would have reached the troposphere, the lowest level of Earth's atmosphere. This means all kinds of elementary particles would have been able to penetrate down through the atmosphere to altitudes just 10 kilometres above the ground. And some heavier particles, such as more massive versions of electrons called muons, would have reached all the way to the planet's surface. The effect of all these muons bombarding living organisms would have been the equivalent of having several CT scans a year. And of course, CT scans have some danger associated with them, which is why doctors don't recommend them unless they're absolutely necessary. An increased risk of cancer and mutations would have been the most obvious consequences for Earth's biology from supernova cosmic rays. Malott and colleagues reached their conclusions by studying the Pleistocene fossil record in Africa, which would have been about the same time that cosmic rays from the supernova 2.6 million years ago would have reached the Earth. While there wasn't a mass extinction event taking place at that time, the authors did find an unusually high level of species turnover. That could have been caused by the supernova, or by some other event, such as climate change. No one knows for sure. In addition to the cosmic rays, the energy from the supernova 2.6 million years ago would have also caused a blue light from the supernova to shine across the sky at night for about a month. And that's already been shown to be a fairly bad thing for most living organisms because it throws off sleep and messes up melatonin production. In fact, blue LED streetlights have already been shown to have a bad effect on animals, causing behavioural changes. Atmospheric ionisation caused by the supernova through cosmic rays would have been a more serious problem. 
You see, when cosmic rays come down, they knock electrons off atoms and molecules in the atmosphere, in the process creating a pathway for lightning to get started more easily. And the thing is, lightning's the number one cause of wildfires other than humans. And an increase in the frequency of wildfires would dramatically change the ecology of a region. A big increase in lightning would also mean a big increase in nitrates coming out in the rain, which would act as a fertiliser. So, an increase in cosmic rays from a supernova 2.6 million years ago could have sparked an increase in lightning, causing more wildfires, and resulting in a drop-off in tree cover and an increase in grasslands in northeastern Africa. And the reason all that's important is because 2.6 million years ago, that could have forced a certain primate species out of the trees, and consequently affected the evolution of that primate species, which eventually led to Homo sapien. The good news is the closest potential supernova to Earth right now is Betelgeuse, which is around 600 light years away. Far enough not to worry about. As for other stars, which could explode as gamma ray bursts, that's a slightly bigger worry. We'll have more on that in our next episode. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Scientists using NASA's Planet Hunting Kepler Space Telescope have announced the discovery of hundreds of new exoplanets, planets orbiting stars other than the Sun. The 219 new exoplanetary candidates bring the total number discovered by Kepler to a staggering 4,034. Of those, some 2,335 have been verified as exoplanets. A report in the Astronomical Journal and on the pre-press physics website archive.org have found 10 of the new exoplanetary discoveries are both similar in size to the Earth and located within their host star's habitable zone, where temperatures make it possible for liquid water to pool on the surface of a terrestrial world. That brings the total number of near-Earth-sized habitable zone candidates detected by Kepler to roughly 50, more than 30 of which have so far been verified. The latest exoplanetary release is the most comprehensive and detailed catalogue release of candidate exoplanets from Kepler's first four years of data. It's also the final catalogue for the spacecraft's view of the patch of sky in the constellation Cygnus. As well as Cygnus, Kepler's also been looking at the constellation Lyra. More on that to come. The new Kepler data has also suggested two very distinct size groupings for small terrestrial planets, and both results have significant implications in the search for life. The final Kepler catalogue will serve as the foundation for more study to determine the prevalence and demographics of planets in our galaxy. The discovery of two distinct planetary populations shows that about half of the planets we know in our galaxy have either no surface or, more likely, a surface lying deep beneath a crushing atmosphere, an environment unlikely to host life. NASA's Kepler program scientist Mario Perez says the Kepler data set is unique because it's the only one containing a population of these near-Earth analogues planets with roughly the same size and orbit as the Earth. Perez says understanding their frequency in our galaxy will help inform the design of future NASA missions to directly image other Earths. The Kepler telescope hunts for planets by detecting slight changes in the star's brightness, changes caused by a planet passing in front of or transiting the star as seen from Kepler's position. Now, if Kepler detects the same dimming effect on at least three separate occasions at the same intervals, then it's likely to potentially be an orbiting planet. This is the eighth release of the Kepler Candidate Catalogue data, gathered by reprocessing the entire set of data from Kepler's observations during the first four years of its primary mission. This data will enable scientists to determine what planetary populations make up our galaxy's planetary demographics. To ensure a lot of planets weren't missed, the team introduced their own simulated planet transit signals into the data set and determined how many were correctly identified as planets. Then they added data that appeared to come from a planet but was actually a false signal to check out how often the analysis mistook these signals for planetary candidates. The work told them which types of planets were being overcounted and which were undercounted by the Kepler team's data processing methods. The study's leader, Susan Thompson from the SETI Institute, that's the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, says this catalogue provides the foundation for directly answering one of astronomy's most compelling questions, namely how many Earth-like planets are there in the Milky Way? Meanwhile, researchers carrying out a separate study also took advantage of the Kepler data, discovering that small planets, like Earth, actually fit into two very distinct types. The team found what appears to be a clean division in the sizes of rocky Earth-sized planets and gaseous planets smaller than Neptune. 
Intriguingly, they found very few planets between these two groupings. The study's lead author, Benjamin Fulton from the University of Hawaii, likes to think of classifying planets in the same way biologists identify new species of animals. Fulton says finding two distinct groups of exoplanets is a lot like discovering that mammals and lizards make up separate distinct branches in the family tree of life. Using the Keck Observatory in Hawaii, the authors measured the sizes of some 1,300 stars in the Kepler field of view in order to determine the radius of some 2,000 Kepler planets with exquisite precision. Fulton says it seems nature commonly makes rocky planets up to about 75% bigger than the Earth. But for reasons scientists don't yet understand, about half of those planets take on a small amount of hydrogen and helium, about 1%. This dramatically swells their size, turning them into gaseous Neptune-sized worlds. The hydrogen and helium atmosphere doesn't contribute much towards the mass of the system as a whole, but it does contribute significantly to the planet's volume, making it a lot bigger in size. Planets that don't accumulate enough gas during their formation may wind up losing most of the gas they do get, either through stellar winds or radiation exposure from the host star, either way keeping them small and Earth-sized. Still, this hypothesis doesn't really explain the gap between Earth-sized terrestrial exoplanets and those closer in size to planets like Neptune and Uranus. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos and other things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase. And that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Scientists studying collisions in the world's largest atom smasher have detected hints of an extreme state of matter called a quark-gluon plasma, which represents some of the very first material to form in the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. As the universe cooled, this primordial plasma of fundamental particles eventually combined, creating the first protons and neutrons, which in turn led to the creation of the first atoms and eventually stars, planets and people. The new observation marks the first time that quark-gluon plasma has been created through proton-proton collisions. A report in the journal Nature Physics claims the new results challenge long-held notions about the nature of proton-proton collisions and about possible phenomena which may previously have been missed. Scientists previously thought protons would be too light to produce such an extremely hot and dense plasma. However, these new results are forcing physicists to question that assumption. The scientists produced the quark-gluon plasma during proton-proton collisions in the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, the European Organisation for Nuclear Research. The supercollider is located in a 27-kilometre long ring under the Franco-Swiss border. Packets of subatomic particles are fired around the ring in opposite directions at some 99.999% the speed of light. Guided by powerful, supercooled cryogenic magnets, the particle packets are smashed into each other in giant underground particle detector experiments situated around the ring. The quark-gluon plasma detections were made by physicists with the ALICE collaboration, one of the collider's four primary detectors. Scientists with the Large Hadron Collider and their counterparts at the United States Department of Energy's Brookhaven National Laboratory's Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider had previously only created quark-gluon plasma through heavy ion gold-gold and lead-lead collisions. Quarks are elemental subatomic particles held together by force particles called gluons. Combined, they form the protons and neutrons found in the nucleus of atoms. Quarks come in six different types, known as flavours, each with their own characteristics. These flavours are named up, down, top, bottom, charm and strange. In a quark-gluon plasma, medium-sized quarks, such as strange quarks, freely roam about and eventually bond into bigger composite particles. It's similar to the way quartz crystals grow within molten granite rocks as they slowly cool. These particles, called hadrons, are then ejected as the plasma fizzles out and serve as telltale signatures of their plasma origin. The ALICE researchers observed higher than expected rates of hadrons containing strange quarks being emitted from their proton-proton collisions. They also detected an even bigger gap between predicted levels of particles containing two or three strange quarks and the numbers actually observed. 
Now, from a purely theoretical perspective, a proliferation of strange hadrons isn't enough to definitively confirm the existence of quark-gluon plasma. After all, it could be the result of some other unknown processes occurring at the subatomic level. Still, it's all very interesting, as well as raising questions about how possible quark-gluon plasma signatures could arise in proton-proton collisions, the findings are also intriguing high-energy physicists who have never previously encountered such a phenomenon in proton-proton collisions. It's worth noting that some earlier Large Hadron Collider research did already find that the spatial orientation of particles produced during some proton-proton collisions mirrored the patterns created during heavy ion collisions. And that was already suggestive that maybe these two different types of collisions may have a lot more in common than previously predicted. Scientists working with the ALICE experiment will now need to explore multiple characteristics of these strange proton-proton collisions before they can confirm that they're really seeing minuscule droplets of the early universe. Now, I say droplets because quark-gluon plasma is actually a fluid, and scientists will need to look at their hydrodynamic features as the composition of the escaping particles wouldn't be sufficiently conclusive. These findings come from data collected during the first run of the Large Hadron Collider back between 2009 and 2013. More research over the next few years will help scientists determine whether or not the Large Hadron Collider really can make quark-gluon plasma in proton-proton collisions. Being able to isolate quark-gluon plasma in a smaller, simpler system such as a proton-proton collision opens up an entirely new dimension for the study of the properties of the primordial state the universe emerged from. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. Strato launch has finally shown off its new megaplane, a giant twin fuselage, six engine aircraft designed to launch rockets into space. The 227 ton plane has a wingspan of 117 metres and an all up takeoff weight of 545 tonnes, making it second only to the world's largest aircraft, the Antonov AN 225 Maria, which has a maximum takeoff weight of 640 tonnes. Once operational, the airborne rocket launcher will lift off from a conventional 3.7 km long runway, carrying its rocket payload between its two fuselage sections. The strato launcher will then climb to an altitude of about 35,000 feet or 11 km before releasing its 230-ton rocket payload and returning to base. Once released and clear of the strato launcher, the rocket payload will then ignite its own main engines and ascend into space. Orbital ATK, which plan to use the new Strato launcher, already uses a similar launch system for its four-stage Pegasus rocket, which is carried to an altitude of about 12 kilometers or 40,000 feet, attached to the underbelly of a specially modified Lockheed L-1011 TriStar airliner. The Pegasus is then released to ignite its own rocket engine and fly into orbit. Put simply, the L-1011 serves as a booster, increasing payloads at reduced costs. 40,000 feet is only about 4% of low Earth orbital altitude, and the subsonic airliner only reaches about 3% of orbital velocity. Yet by delivering the launch vehicle to this speed and altitude, the reusable aircraft replaces the need for a costly first stage booster. The Strata launcher was built by Burt Rutan Scaled Composites, the same company which won the XPRIZE back in 2004, becoming the first private venture to successfully send a manned reusable spacecraft into space twice in a period of two weeks. That manned space plane, Spaceship One, used the same launch system as the Strato launcher, being carried to an altitude of almost 44,000 feet or 14 kilometers, mounted on the underbelly of a purpose-built jet-powered mothership called the White Knight. Once at altitude, Spaceship One was released to fire up its rocket engine and undertake a ballistic trajectory to an altitude of over 100 kilometers, the official start of space. After spending a few minutes experiencing zero gravity, the space plane glided back to Earth, landing on a conventional runway. Scaled Composites are now developing a fleet of passenger-carrying spacecraft known as Spaceship Two, which are based on the Spaceship One launch system. They're being built for Sir Richard Branson's new space tourism venture, Virgin Galactic. In fact, the Strata launcher's twin fuselage configuration is based on the twin fuselage design of the White Knight Two, which will be the mothership for the new Virgin Galactic Spaceship Two space plane. The new Strata launcher was wheeled out for its public debut at the Mojave Airport near Los Angeles, the same place where Spaceship One was based and launched. The first spacecraft to be launched from the underbelly of an aircraft was the famous X-15, which set the first altitude record for a winged spacecraft, 107.8 kilometres. That was back in August 1963. 
The X-15 also still holds the world record for the fastest manned powered aircraft, a speed of 7,274 kilometres per hour set in October 1967. The X-15 was taken to launch strapped under the wing of a B-52 bomber. Scaled Composites began working on the Strata Launcher project in 2011. This included the construction of a purpose-built hangar at Mojave Airport to assemble the giant aircraft. The first test flight for the Strata Launcher is planned for 2019. To find out more, Andrew Dunkley speaking with Dr Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory. The latest project from the team that came up with and built the Virgin Galactic vehicle concept. This thing's a little bit different from what Virgin Galactic has uh, been um, working on. This is the Strato launch massive mothership and I'm, I'm looking at a photo of it. It is extraordinary, Fred. It is a huge aircraft, a very, very unusual design, recently unveiled, built by a sky- Composites. This is the company that was founded by Bert Rutan. They won the X Prize. That's right. In, and the, and the X led... Prize was sending a space vehicle that could be retrieved into what is technically space and back twice. Exactly. Yeah. With a with a human passenger. Yeah. Uh, or you know, with a human uh, a pilot. And the I first person to pilots. do it got three bazillion gazillion dollars or something. Mm. Uh, that's right. Well, it was actually about. I think it was ten million. It, wasn't it was that quite, much. Uh, well, yeah, it was quite quite modest. It probably cost a lot more than that to do it. Yeah. But that, of course, led to the foundation of Virgin Galactic because Bert Rutan's company was heavily underwritten by by Richard Branson. And so the, just just to recap on that, the, the, the way Virgin Galactic works is there's, there's a mothership which has four engines. It's just like a, a big jet, but instead of having one fuselage, it's got two uh, separated by enough space to hang the rocket plane under the middle bit. And the rocket plane is what takes the fair-paying passengers up to the edge of space, 100 kilometres away. Mm. That's a structure that uh, has been tested actually many times. They've flown the Virgin Galactic mothership and the, and it's uh, and it's you know what I've read is sometimes called a parasite vessel, the parasite ship, which is the rocket plane slung underneath it. We heard from the outset that whilst this is intended purely for space tourism, that Branson and his team were also thinking of using this this setup to launch not rocket planes carrying passengers just up to 100 kilometres, but to launch smaller vehicles that would actually achieve Earth orbit. In other words, you sling a rocket underneath it and it has a payload, which might be a communication satellite or something, and then away it goes. You take the mothership up to, I think their launch height is 16 kilometres, which is kind of getting on for 50,000 feet. It's a long way up. That's way up there. You launch the rocket and that then carries on and takes a satellite into orbit. So what we're seeing now with the the Strato launch project is that on steroids. So instead of a four-engine jet, we now have a six-engine jet with a wingspan of more than 100 metres, as far as I can make out. It's the biggest, uh, probably the biggest wingspan of any aircraft ever built. The engines that it uses are Pratt & Whitney turbofans with a huge amount of combined thrust. The idea is that it will carry payloads in the wing space between its two fuselages and will take them up, yes, to the stratosphere and launch them from there. And it has n- numerous advantages for all kinds of reasons. The best one, of course, is that you've got a, effectively a reusable first stage, unlike the SpaceX first stage, which lands back on its tail firing its rocket motor. Motors, this first stage is actually a jet plane, and so it can be used many, many times. The other thing is that it can carry not just one rocket to head off as the second stage up to the up to orbital height. It can carry probably two or three, and it can also fly for great distances around the world. So you can bet your boots that the Pentagon is very, very interested in this because it provides a mobile missile launch system, of course, that um, is unlike uh, almost anything else that you can imagine. You can put this thing anywhere. I guess that's the principle of the missile submarines, which we know circle the globe as well. But this one is rather different because your base vehicles need to be only smaller because the first stage is the aircraft itself. I'm talking a lot about something that excites me a lot, I'm more interested in its applications for space exploration, but I really look forward to seeing this 
Strato Launch Mothership in the air. We'll see videos soon, I'm sure, and look forward to hearing what it can do. Yeah, I mean, it, they're talking, <coughs> as you said, massive payloads. Uh, it's pushed along by six Pratt & Whitney uh, turbofan engines. That's six. A jumbo yeah. jet only has four of those. So its combined thrust will be 340,500 pounds, which is... Um, you know, really pushing it up there. And the thing, like to to describe it, it just looks like two aeroplanes that have been fused together halfway along their wings. That's really, there's two main, there's two fuselages, one mega wing, uh, two separated tails and tail fins and two, uh, two cabins and <laughs> and it's it's big i mean you thought the spruce goose was big and it only got <laughs> two feet off the ground or something but this thing is huge i think they're saying the wingspan's what 385 feet or something it's uh, yeah so it's more than 100 meters it's that's just right. unbelievable yeah. i mean that's that's yeah. That's a pitching wedge. Um, yeah, quite amazing. And, um, yeah, I can't wait to see what they do with it. I mean, just imagine watching that thing take off. Uh, that's right. Yeah, you probably your heart will be in your mouth. And just one postscript to this, Andrew. This idea of carrying rockets underneath aircraft is not entirely new because the Orbital Company, which is one of the principal players in terms of space launches, they have um, TriStar and they, they use this. Uh, it's called Stargazer. They use it to carry rockets up to, again, a height in the stratosphere to be launched with whatever payload is required. So that that's a much smaller version, I guess, and perhaps more conventional version of what the Strato launch system is all about. But yeah, it's great stuff and marvellous engineering. That's Dr. Fred Watson from the Australian Astronomical Observatory speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice weekly podcast through iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, your favourite podcast download provider, or direct from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. The show's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio and as part of Virgin Australia's in-flight entertainment. If you want more space time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos and other things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at spacetimewithstuartgary on Instagram, and on Facebook just go to www.facebook.com forward slash space time with Stuart Gary. Space time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, Pocket Casts or Audio Boom. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.